Welcome to Washburn University. My name is Dr. Austin Way. I am the bassoon professor here at the School of Music. And today we're going to be looking at this year's brand new set of KMEA audition excerpts for the bassoon, starting out with the Beethoven excerpt. For each excerpt, what I want to start with is I first want to give you a drone to practice against. The reason I want to recommend a droning pitch is because it's a much better way to not only train your intonation, but also to train your ears. This will help train you from reed to reed, from bassoon to bassoon. Your ears will always be consistent as long as they're well tuned, and you don't have to worry quite as much about the differences between individual parts of the instrument, reeds, vocals, things like that. So for this first one, what I would recommend starting out with is a drone of a D. We'll always have some different options as we go through. So with this one, if you find you need to move the drone around, let's say, for example, in the key of D major, it can be difficult to tune against a drone of a D to have a B natural sound in tune. It's just kind of a weird interval. A C sharp is going to be strange as well because it's so dissonant. So if you find you need to move it around a little bit to accommodate spots, then that's perfectly fine. You could have a measure to you move the drone to a B just to figure out where you're landing. Uh, but overall, I would recommend sticking with the D throughout, especially because D major is not a great key on really the bassoon, but really any wind instrument. It's just not very favorable for intonation. So the drone will be really helpful to get used to where these notes are going to fall. Primarily, however, I have one thing I want to really encourage you to focus on in this excerpt, which is rhythm. This one, it doesn't look like it's going to be that rhythmically challenging, but there are a lot of different rhythmic values present here. We have quarter notes, dotted quarter notes, tied quarter notes, uh, as well as moving eighth notes and dotted half notes. The tied quarter notes, even though they're the same rhythmic duration as a dotted quarter note, they look different on the page and they function differently. And so it's easy to handle them in a different way. Uh, especially because the tied notes are tying usually into a strong beat, into beat one or three. And if we don't get to play something on a strong beat, it's hard to perceive it. So what I would recommend you do as you go through this excerpt is, first of all, is, is the case with any excerpt of any kind, be sure you know the context. I would definitely listen to a couple of recordings of this piece in the original orchestra so you can hear what this part is doing. Uh, and what that's going to inform you is that this melody is actually a counter melody that happens on top of the Ode to Joy theme. This is the piece where that theme is introduced. And it's a very metrically simple theme. It's mostly quarter notes and half notes. It's just very steady. And so our counter melody that we're playing here has to be just as rhythmically steady as the Ode to Joy theme. So all of these ties, all these dots need to be handled really precisely. I would definitely practice this with a metronome that has been subdivided down to eighth notes to start, so you can feel the eighth notes. And beyond that, you can tongue every eighth note in this excerpt as a way to practice, just so you can personally feel out where every beat falls, where every subdivision of the beat falls. And if nothing else, I would definitely practice this breaking the ties temporarily. You don't want to do that in the audition. Uh, but just so you can really feel where those beats one and three are always going to fall. <laughs> So in the second excerpt in the Firebird, we have just a small portion of this whole solo. First off, what I would recommend using as a drone is an E flat. Uh, this is an E flat minor, although you can also use a B flat, B as in boy, uh, if you want to focus on centering that first note. Uh, but the actual tonic would be of an E flat throughout here. Uh, this one is challenging because it can be a very repetitive solo. Uh, so I already mentioned we're just getting the tail end of this bersus, or which means lullaby in this case. Uh, this just happens towards the end of the Firebird, the ballet, or the suite, depending on what you're playing. 
This is a famously redundant solo. The same melody happens several times in the first iteration of it. And so by the time we get to these last two lines of the solo, we have finally have some, not only opportunity, but really need to create some musical contrast. So I would encourage you to be creative with what you're doing with what's on the page. Dynamically, there's very little, it just says piano. Uh, but it's traditional to interpret this a little bit beyond that. So what I've done here in my demonstration is a pretty common approach for the phrasing that a lot of people will do. You can start the first two measures at a more comfortable dynamic. The third and fourth bars I like to bring down to a very soft dynamic as a way of highlighting the new introduction of the D natural that's in bar four. If you were to look at the first part of the solo, it's all D flats throughout in that uh, part of the passage. So this is some new contrast. So bringing it down brings people in closer to hear you're about to do something different. And then I like to come up in bars uh, five and six to have something a little stronger and then just let it kind of taper down naturally to the end of the phrase. You don't necessarily have to do that. You could do two four bar phrases where you just phrase through, just be sure you're playing across bar lines so that it's all very connected. Uh, and one last thing with this one, similar to the Beethoven, there are some rhythmic challenges in here. There are ties, which you can practice exactly the same way as you would practice the ties in the Beethoven by breaking them in your practice and then putting them back when you go through. Uh, but additionally, there's another rhythm trap in here. There are duple eighth notes right next to triplet eighth notes, and that's really difficult to get those even. The tendency for most people, if you're just doing this kind of by ear, is you'll get ta, 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 where when you get to the triplet, the third note of the triplet is quite a bit faster than the first and second notes of the triplet. So a good way to get around this is you can find the common subdivision that works between both duple and triple eighth notes, and that is a 16th note septuplet. So the way you would practice that, and also just a quick note with practicing rhythm, you do not need an instrument to practice rhythm. And I would encourage you to set your instrument down and just work through the rhythm just on your own, just so you can feel it out, just in the same way the drone is gonna train your ears, Focusing on rhythm is a skill that really exists beyond having an instrument in your hands. So for this moment, this is looking at, for example, the very last bar of this excerpt. You can just walk yourself through. I like to kind of conduct myself and sometimes snap uh, the beat. So da 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 That gives you that six notes per beat. It's giving three notes on each duple eighth note, two notes on each triple eighth note. But the subdivision stays exactly the same through the beat even though the rhythm is shifting. So that'll give you a really good way to consistently feel out how that rhythm is going to align to be sure you avoid that really common rhythmic problem at the end of the triplet. <laughs> So for the Bach, what I would recommend doing, first off, for a drone, you can use a drone of a G pretty much throughout this excerpt. It does modulate a little bit. You might also experiment with using a drone of a D, and by the end of the final line, you can also shift it to a B flat if you'd like. But a G will work perfectly well throughout, as will a D. The main challenge with this excerpt is it's not very active at the start and it gets much busier as we go along. So you wanna be sure that where you start with these quarter notes at the very beginning, you're thinking 16th notes. And ideally, in this case, you wanna find whatever you have in the probably third or fourth lines or so that feels the most uncomfortable to you and use that as your tempo reference. You don't need to go any faster than that. You shouldn't go any faster than that because this should sound very steady, very even. What we wanna keep in mind for style here, this is a fugue. So if you're not familiar with the form of a fugue, it's a very interactive sort of musical form where we have usually a very simple theme introduced at the beginning or subject of the fugue, which we have right away. 
And then it becomes more complicated. And all these complications just layer up on top of each other, but they interact with each other. So you want to think about when you have these moving 16th notes, they need to move slowly and clearly enough that they could interact with this first few bars of this uh, excerpt, this subject that's going on. So you can hear each individual note. Every note is very important in Bach, so keep that in mind. Additionally, this piece was not originally for the orchestra. This was originally composed for the organ, like the one behind me here. Uh, and you're not probably gonna hear an organist moving quite as rapidly as you might hear, say, a lot of piano repertoire, things like that. It's gonna have a little more stately flow to it. So be sure this one doesn't pick up too much steam and especially be sure it doesn't start with too much steam, otherwise you'll be in trouble once you get going. Uh, additionally with this one, I think this is a really good example of we wanna be sure to always have the music provided by whoever we're auditioning for. So in this case, Kansas has provided us with this specific copy of this excerpt. The reason I bring this up, especially for this one, uh, there's some unusual choices with the slurs that are in here that probably aren't the most appropriate for this style or this era. But this is what's on the page. And so even though if I were to perform this, this is different than the way I would choose to perform it. If I'm auditioning, you want to be sure you're playing what they want to hear. You can assume that if they've provided you with a specific edition or a specific copy, that's what they want. And so you want to be sure to adhere really strictly to that. And the same is true for all of these excerpts. You can, of course, find a copy of the whole part for the Beethoven Symphony or for the Firebird, but I would play off of these specific excerpts just to be sure that your articulations match their expectations or any dynamics or you know the trills that are in here, anything of that nature. <laughs> So for the Granger, you can use a drone of a D-flat. This isn't D-flat major, but this one kind of moves in and out of A-flat pretty quickly. So you might actually find an A-flat drone to be more effective for what you're listening for. You could use both, uh, but I do want to mention the D-flat just because that is the actual tonal center of this piece. Uh, but again, you might find an A-flat more useful in this. There's not a whole lot to say with this one. This one, just be sure to don't overcomplicate it, don't overthink it. We have an indication right at the beginning where it's uh, specified to play this in a detached way, which is pretty common when we're in 6-8 and moving in this kind of rhythm anyway to do what we would refer to as a lilt. And so that's basically just where you can lift the notes a little bit. You don't need to play things full value all the way through to the bar line or all the way through to the next beat. Uh, just let the air out of the note a little bit. Just be sure that when you introduce some silence into the music, that that doesn't start to be closed up. And so that doesn't cause you to rush as you go through. Uh, one technical note about this one that's just a helpful thing to uh, be prepared for as you're practicing this. The uh, note clarity is very important in this one, and of course all of them, but in this one we're up in a range where we can crack notes pretty easily on the bassoon. And in this case in particular, the high A flat and the high G flat are two notes that are gonna be really easy to crack. In the case of the A flat, if you find that one's cracking, I would reevaluate your half hole. We say half hole is a technique, but it's probably less than half open in this case for a high A flat on most bassoons. But it will depend on your instrument. And that's true of any half hold note. It's going to be very specific to your equipment. So you don't necessarily need to do exactly what somebody else is doing. Probably be close, but not exactly the same. Uh, in the case of the A flat and the G flat, if you find both of them are cracking, I would isolate them and do them as breath attacks for a little bit, just as a practice device. The reason being, if the airspeed is too slow to start, it's probably going to start to on a lower partial or crack down to a lower note. If you have a faster, more focused airstream, that's going to immediately send you out to a higher pitch. So if you take the tongue out and just practice breath attacking these notes, you can see what you need to have present right away because the tongue can't fix any of that for you. You have to have your airspeed ready to go immediately, and that'll help you isolate that and figure out exactly what you need once you add the tongue back in. <laughs> Thank you. 
the Weisenborn. This is a portion of a really classic Weisenborn etude. The reason I highlight this as a portion is even though this isn't an orchestral excerpt, this is one where the context is still really important because this is just part of the etude. This is just really the setup of it. Uh, so I would encourage you to go ahead and read through the entire A2 just to feel out what this is doing musically, because this entire three line portion is really just uh, kind of a preamble to the next section that follows. So you want to be sure you know where this is going to head. Uh, similar to the Granger excerpt, this one is technically in D minor, but I would probably drone an A instead because this doesn't really go to D minor until the next section. It's really just kind of teasing this resolution the whole time. So an A drone would probably be of the most use. But again, you can move it around to isolate specific notes. You can also use a C sharp drone throughout, and that would be useful as well. Uh, the most challenging thing with this one is just figuring out how to pace it. Uh, at the beginning, the way I play this and the way I played this here is I do just a little bit of rubato, especially in the third and fourth bars. I like to push as I go down and then start to settle as I get towards the bottom of that descending passage from the tenor G down to the C sharp, the low C sharp. You don't have to do that. That's not printed. And if you're concerned about doing that in an audition and making it seem like it, you're just rushing, then I would just do it very steadily for the sake of an audition. Um, that said, if you're going to implement rubato like that, you want to be sure that you're both pushing and pulling so that you're balancing it out, everything always happening in pretty equal measure so that it always sounds like it's coming back to the same average tempo as you go. Um, and just keep in mind, as you're practicing anything that uses rubato, the real difference between rushing and dragging and pushing and pulling is doing it deliberately in a way that's controlled, a way that's set up well, so it doesn't just suddenly speed up or suddenly slow down. Uh, and also, again, making sure you balance it out with slowing and speeding as you go through. The one that is printed, so in the end of the second line where we have this stringendo for a couple of bars before setting up this rallentando, a couple of pieces of advice for that. I would think in two note groups, so don't think of speeding up the entire bar, just think in small portions as you go through to keep it even. Don't start it right away if you can help it. Try to put it off for a beat or two, just kind of start to let the tempo warm up just a hair and then let it start to take off at the very, very end of the stringendo, right before you hit the rallentando, and then let it relax down. Uh, but I would just spend some time practicing it first with just a little bit of acceleration, a little bit of deceleration, and then gradually let it bloom into something a little bigger. This doesn't need to get too fast because it'll sound chaotic if it just really takes off. So really play with your pacing there just to be sure. It's always staying within your control. Just let it intensify a bit. Don't think about trying to be overly virtuosic in this passage. <laughs> So for the Jean Perry, with this one, it's a little tricky for a drone because this one moves through a different key in every line. Uh, so I'll give you four different drones that you can use for each different line if you want to shift it around to have different tonal centers. Uh, so we start in G minor. So you can use a G drone at the very beginning. And then in the second line, we have modulated to E flat major. So you can use an E flat drone here. Uh, in the third line, you can shift it to a C uh, for C minor. Uh, and then the final line, we're in A flat major. So you can move your drone over to an A flat at the end. Uh, what you can also do is if you want to just keep a drone consistent throughout, you can experiment with all four of these for all four lines. Technically, you can tune any interval, even dissonant intervals. And so you can keep a drone consistent. It's just having a drone of an A flat might not be the most useful reference in the first line when you're in G minor. Um, but it's a good challenge, so there's nothing wrong with doing that. This one, it's really very straightforward. These Jean Perry technical etudes, they're one of those things where either you, you can or you can't in the moment. So I would just be sure you're choosing a tempo where you can play it evenly and steadily. Uh, two main things to look out for with this one. When we have these 16th note patterns, you want to be sure that the 16th notes are spread very evenly across the beat. Uh, and especially keep your ear out for the second and fourth 16th notes 
of these groups of four because those are the ones that often get lost. And when I say get lost, that either means they're moving too quickly, so we might rush through those notes and just kind of metrically lose them. Or in this case, it's very easy to lose notes because as we're ascending into the tenor register up to this tenor G at the start and these upper notes above the, the open F break, uh, it's easy for the sound to get really thin and really weak because the lower notes are going to naturally sound stronger than the upper notes. So you might feel like you're having to blow through on the way up, almost doing a fairly significant crescendo, for example, in the first bar from the low G to the tenor G. Uh, that's going to need much faster air up at the top, whereas the low G can take a slower airstream and still have a strong sound. So you want to be sure to keep everything really consistent, really under control. Uh, in terms of connectivity, but again, I would definitely choose a tempo that's going to be very successful and very consistent for what your technique uh, is handling at the moment. All right, so once again, I am Dr. Austin Way, the bassoon professor here at Washburn University School of Music. Uh, if you have any questions about these excerpts or really just all things bassoon, my email address is austin.way at washburn.edu. That will be available in the info of this video. I would love to hear from any of you. Don't hesitate to reach out. And if you would like to play some of these excerpts for me, please feel free to find a time to come to our campus. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to set up a time for a free lesson if you'd like to come in before your audition. I'm always happy to help out with any questions or follow-ups you might have. Um, and for those of you that are going to be auditioning this year, enjoy the new excerpts. They are easier than what we had before, so enjoy the break from the French repertoire and have a good time with your auditions.